This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. The combat dogfight is nothing more than a gladiator-like struggle to the death. And as I've often said, it has only one rule, and that is there are no rules. Detroit, we got Come on back around. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat. My name is Vincent Aiello. I am your host. And today, we have a very special treat for you. We are going to skip the announcements and listener questions for the time being, and instead proceed straight to the interview, because with me in studio today is a gentleman who has spent nearly the last half century in service to this nation, including 12 years on active duty in the United States Navy, then another 35 years in the Naval Reserves. He has had a 45-year association with Top Gun, including four years as an instructor and 30 years as a consultant, where he teaches a class on air combat. During his flying career, he accrued 3,300 flight hours and 500 carrier landings, mainly in the F-4 Phantom II and also the F-14 Tomcat. He flew 170 combat missions in Southeast Asia and is the youngest living air combat ace and one of only two U.S. Navy aces from the Vietnam conflict. I believe the other was your pilot. He was shot down by an enemy SAM, but rescued by friendly forces. His military awards include the Navy's highest medal for valor, the Navy Cross, two silver stars, the Purple Heart, and 10 air medals. Apart from the Navy, he has had a successful career in commercial real estate and is now an accomplished author, a leadership consultant, and motivational speaker across the United States. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Stonehill College and a master's in system management from the University of Southern California. It is my honor to introduce and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Commander Bill Willie D. Driscoll, United States Navy Reserves, retired. Sir, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, it is an honor to be here, and by studio, I mean your beautiful home here in San Diego. Thank you for having me over, and I really look forward to this, and I know my listeners do as well. You know, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is relatively new. We've had several episodes, some on call signs, some on flight gear, ejection seats, aerial refueling, and a whole lot more. Uh, You've lived all those subjects, and probably most of the future topics we're going to cover on this podcast. You have an amazing story that we're going to explore today. Uh, But first, let's start at the beginning. Now, you were born and raised in New England. and What inspired you to join the military, specifically naval aviation? You know, my uh, grandfather ran an armory in World War I. My father fought during World War II, and I was graduating from college in the the spring of 1968. And back then, the Vietnam War was raging hot and heavy. So I figured uh, it was time for me to do my turn. And I was absolutely outraged at the treatment of our uh, aviators in the prison war camps in North Vietnam. So I said to myself, I'm going to get into naval aviation here. I just want to do my part there. So went down, took the flight test, uh, qualified for the Naval Flight Officer Program, went through flight school at Pensacola, and always had a, a very firm goal to want to get into fighters. So did whatever it took to spend the time and effort to get through flight school and keep, get myself qualified to, to fly the F-4 Phantom. Did you have any idea at the time that joining the Navy would subsequently define the rest of your life as it has? No idea at all. I, my plan was to go in uh, ser- to serve my time and then go back to Massachusetts and go to law school. You know, sailors on modern aircraft carriers have email, internet, albeit kind of spotty and slow, but they have internet and sailor phones. Uh, what was life at sea like during the Vietnam conflict? You know, probably not a lot different. Uh, the, the, back then during the conflict, uh, in a, in a seven-day uh, week, we flew um, two hops uh, five out of the seven times. Sometimes we fly a spare, but uh, we always had to be uh, prepared for the next flight, get it debriefed, get a bite to eat quickly, get ready to uh, brief and get ready for the next one. So it was pretty, uh, pretty hectic pace uh, when we were out there on the line. I can imagine. Did you have collateral duties as well? Uh, did you have to take care of one of the maintenance divisions? or? Right. I was the uh, corrosion control officer. Okay. So uh, you, we had uh, uh, folks that we had to take care of, and we typically would get out in the evening or after our flying was done and just explain to them where we were that day and what we were doing when we were uh, in over enemy territory. Sure. 
The American media and society in general uh, regard the military radically different today than they did during the Vietnam era. Uh, what were your experiences then, and how are they different now? You know, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the approval rating of the military back during the Vietnam era was like maybe 29 to 32 percent, something like that. And it's absolutely flip-flopped. It's Now it's uh, 78, 79 percent have a, a favorable uh, approval rating, which is good. I myself, uh, back during the Vietnam era, was very focused on making sure I did the right thing uh, for my squadron mates when we were airborne, that I was always well prepared and, and tried to be as good a teammate and as, as good a, uh, an aviator as possible and didn't consider the uh, the criticism, didn't pay attention to it, number one, and uh, didn't take it personally. I figured that you know we live in a, a democracy and a free society. If our citizens want to express themselves a certain way, that's their right. But I was very focused on the missions at hand and the ones that were coming up next. In your book, Peak Performance Under Pressure, and in his book, Fox 2, you and Randy Duke Cunningham describe flying together frequently, almost exclusively. For combat missions, were you only crewed with each other? Yes. If one of us had the duty, the other guy didn't fly. Okay. Uh, so it, it probably of uh, my 170 combat missions, I probably flew 100, 166 or 67 with him. Wow. How would you describe the bond that is formed between two people, two men in this case, uh, who experience such traumatic events together, both the euphoric highs and the devastating lows? I mean, you, you had the joy, I guess. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but certainly uh, the high of, of shoot downs. But also you watched your buddies perish. Uh, what, how, what kind of bond does that create between you and, in this case, Duke? You know, it's a, um, a bond that we're, we're welded at the hip. And we're not uh, the best of friends, but he's my most special friend, if you know what I mean. It's a, a unique relationship. He's had certainly his challenges through the years. But I, we talk on the phone once or so a month. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, um, it's, a, it's a unique relationship. But it's, uh, you don't go through those life or death situations uh, with that regularity without it having a, a dramatically positive impact. I would imagine. Uh, in fact, later in his book, Duke talks about uh, when he came home and had some family and marital problems that you were still there for him, just like you were during the conflict. So uh, I would think that uh, the bond has extended ever since because it was forged in fire, essentially, huh? That, that's a safe statement. I, as I've often said, we're, we're welded at the hip. Outstanding. You and Duke were credited with five aerial victories over Vietnam. Tell us about the most memorable engagement for you. Probably the most memorable one was the last one. Uh, we had, on this particular day, we had shot down two enemy airplanes. We were uh, uh, leaving the area. We saw a black speck on the nose. Randy said to me, uh, uh, watch this, Willie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really pass this guy close. And as we were passing him close, we realized it was a MiG, and he started shooting at us. So we had to take a hard cut away from to avoid the bullets. We pulled up uh, up into the extreme vertical, thinking the MiG had run out of deep six o'clock, but he hadn't. He'd gone up into the vertical also. And when he was up in the vertical, he was uh, above us by about maybe 3,000 feet. And the diameter between where we were and where he was was probably at the most a mile. So there were two things that we were not happy about, the fact that he was well above us, and it was a lot tighter than we wanted it to be. But... You know, we lived in a world of, you know, no problem, and we made a hard break into him, and he broke harder into us. So as we came to the bottom of this, he'd picked up 90 degrees on us. So as we pulled up not to hit the ground, he's rapidly closing. We knew he had uh, heat seeker missiles, gun in the nose, and guns on the wing. And he's uh, inside of a half mile closing rapidly. And we pull back up into the vertical, and it's like he's tied on a string. He's right behind us. Um, and we came to the top of the top of this vertical leg, and... As we were at the top of it, he started to shoot. So Randy tried to swap ends as best he could without, you know, losing control of the plane. And the MiG quit shooting, but he followed us through the maneuver perfectly. We, we, we were surprised he was able to do that because this was a pretty violent, evasive maneuver. But he followed us through this perfectly. As we rolled through the bottom again, nose was pointed down to the ground. We pulled up so as not to hit the ground. And at that point, he started to shoot again. So we just tried to skid the plane as best we could sideways to get out of the plane of the bullets, thinking we were really surprised at how well the enemy was flying the plane and how appropriately he was using his, his uh, weapon system. He was just giving us a few squirts at the most uh, vulnerable time for us. The maneuver we ended up in was what was called a slow-speed rolling scissor, and, and your listeners can think of it as a race to the wall, and the second airplane to get there is going to win. And that's uh, we went through maybe two more of these vertical loops, and at the top he would shoot, we try to swap ends as best we could without losing control. 
as we said, the, we, the, the rule here was there are no rules, and the deck is the deck. Through the last vertical leg, as we went up, we felt that we didn't have enough speed to get over the top, and if we went to zero airspeed, he was going to kill us. And at the top, as we approached the top, <coughs> Randy decided to bring the throttle back to idle and put out the speed brake. And as we did this, he, he wasn't, the enemy wasn't expecting this. He flew out in front of us about maybe 1,500 feet. Our plane is vibrating, asking us not to do anything with the controls. And when the MiG realized, the MiG pilot realized he'd done this, he knew that was a huge mistake he just made. He, he dropped his nose and he, he made a hard cut to the left and went down to treetop level. So it allowed us to drop our nose and allowed us to uh, resume a, a much better airspeed. Our few low-level lights started to blink at this point. We still were 30 miles inside enemy territory, but we felt that with um, the few low-level light, we set it at a, at a high rate, and we, f we figured at this point we're going to see what happens next. But with, with the look down we had over the jungle, we felt that was probably the best we were going to get. We fired a heat seeker. It detonated just after his tailpipe, and when it did, about a second or so later, bam, he hit the ground. And we realized how low to the ground we were. We almost hit the ground ourselves. We found out later the pilot flying that airplane uh, had 13 American kills. Um, all I know is the fellow flying it knew how to fly the plane extremely well, and he knew how to work his weapon system. More so than most of the other North Vietnamese pilots Correct. at the time? Correct, right. right. So the leading North Vietnamese pilot met the, at the time, leading American pilot. And in this case, the American crew... Uh, Triumphed. That you know, that it's, it's been a lot of speculation. Some have said yes, he was a leading ace. Others said no. I mean, who, who, all I know is the fellow flying the plane knew exactly what he was doing and, and flew the plane extremely well and, and worked the weapon system at the most uh, vulnerable times for us is when he open, would open fire. Wow. Uh, a very credible opponent. Now, I'd just like to elaborate on a couple things you said because, again, my listeners come from varied backgrounds and they're not as familiar as you and I are who have lived this life. Uh, I haven't lived the life you just described, but uh, in training. So when you said, you know, the, the only rules are there are no rules, I mean, this is a full-up brawl, street fight. You are fighting for your lives with this other airplane, uh, just like two people in a fist fight, except you're doing it in airplanes. You, uh, your listeners can think of it, uh, the combat dogfight is nothing more than a gladiator-like struggle to the death. That's what it is. And as I've often said, it has only one rule, and that is there are no rules. You it's do what a, it takes to kill and survive. Correct. Wow. Uh, you also said the deck is the deck, and I would just like to point out for our listeners, so in training, uh, we use what's called a soft deck and a hard deck, and it just means some altitude above the ground for safety purposes. We have to not maneuver the aircraft too extremely, like it sounds like you and Duke did, because we need some time if the aircraft were to depart controlled flight to recover it before we hit the real ground. Uh, in combat, this you said the opponent was basically at treetop level. I mean, you were fighting all the way down to the trees. Right. Wow. That's amazing. And again, those altitudes are generally 5,000 and 10,000 feet above ground level for training. So we stop at 5,000. We treat 5,000 as if we hit those trees. Right. And at 10,000, we have to have certain attitude and airspeed limitations. Right. Uh, and then fuel. Fuel is always an issue in fighter aviation. Uh, in this case, you're over enemy territory, so it's not like you can just pull up to the tanker overhead because it's a risky environment. So you would have had to get out over the water and to a tanker or back to the ship Right. If you're at low fuel. Okay. Now, we recently, Willie D, had an episode on the Fighter Pilot Podcast explaining aircraft nomenclature. Uh, even though the Phantom is designated the F-4, not the F-A-4, like the F-A-18, uh, in fact, you performed many attack missions over Vietnam. Now, what sorts of ordnance did you carry for air-to-ground, and what were some typical targets? Sure. We carried um, the uh, Mark 82, which was a 500-pound bomb, but when uh, other missions, when we were, uh, flew what's called flak suppressor, we would carry these rock eye uh, bombs, which are, think of them as when they opened up, they were like uh, maybe a thousand hand grenades which would sprinkle out across the ground. It was designed as a weapon, uh, an anti-surface uh, air missile site weapon. Its, its intention was to cause as much damage to a radar facility as possible. And on the, matter of fact, on the day we shot down the three enemy MiGs, we actually were uh, um, flying an air-to-ground mission, but it quickly transitioned to air-to-air -air once the, the the battle started. But we were originally air-to-ground. Because you were loaded with both bombs and missiles? Correct. Okay. Wow. Uh, is there one particular air-to-surface memorable engagement that you can share with us? Well, probably on our uh, the, the day we shot down the three, we were um, going into a very 
uh, densely concentrated area of the enemy's uh, territory, and we were at a place called the Haidong Railroad Yards. We, and it didn't look like the Chicago Railroad Yards, but it was a big transshipment point for them. There were, there were surface air missile sites and anti-aircraft sites right in the vicinity. Our job when they opened fire was to, uh, to roll in and silence them. And just prior to uh, our run, the airplane in front of us, as they were coming off target, uh, they got hit by um, some anti-aircraft. It, was, it came up fast, and it was all over the sky. There was just almost no way they could avoid it. It just was all, all over them. And, and we saw that. Uh, we took a big cutaway to make sure our run, our run and hitting was, was, had been varied from that airplane that just went in. And we rolled it on the area where the, the weapon had just been it just hit our, our friendly airplane and, and silenced those guns. But that was a, a bit dicey because we were rolling in uh, right down the barrel of the gun shooting at us. And uh, the goal was who's going to get there first, us or them? <laughs> You said the word flak earlier. Is that also a name for anti-aircraft? Right, anti-aircraft. As as we call it flak when it detonates in the sky. Now, that day was May 10th, 1972. Uh, When you were egressing after that third kill that day, uh, you admit to letting your guard down a little bit. Uh, Tell us what happened next. Well, we just become aces. We were thrilled at what, what had just happened. We were, we were delighted that we had won this fierce dogfight because the first minute and 50 seconds, we were on the losing end, you know, dodging the enemy's bullets. He made the mistake we just described. We were able to uh, roll back down and, and shoot him down. So as we were pulling out, we're still 30 miles inside enemy territory. We were yapping back and forth. We were really happy and excited about what had happened. But we were talking about the fight that we just were involved in. It was a pretty fierce fight. And as we're climbing out, you know, uh, Randy asked for a, um, a heading in a, um, a bingo setting. And I can still remember we were at a 0.69 climb. We we're going to go to 28,500 feet, make an idle descent to the ship, and try to hit the tanker and route back to the ship. 0.69 Mach? Correct. So that's kind of an energy conserving? Correct. A max conserved slow. climb. Okay. That's exactly right. So, but recognize we're in over enemy territory. And normally we had briefed to be like Mach 1.1, 1. 1, about 650 miles an hour. We're at maybe 360 miles an hour trying to save fuel in a climb. Uh, we're, we're thinking that, well, if there's, we don't see any indications, we must be safe. But the fact of the matter is, if you were to ask me to this day, I'm supposed to be looking at the radar, but I wasn't. I was supposed to be monitoring the radios, but I wasn't. Supposed to be working the electronic equipment, but I wasn't. Supposed to be working electronic countermeasure equipment, but I wasn't. I was just yapping, happy that we had just done what we had just done. And so what happened next? What happened next as we're talking and climbing, I, I feel this white flash, like when you flip your bathroom lights on in the morning. And I look out, and just as I'm looking out, I see this uh, this uh, exhaust of a missile right at our right 2 o'clock position from the cockpit. And then I hear what sounds like somebody taking a handful of BBs and throwing them against the side of your car. And then the plane jounces pretty well, it's like we went, just went through some pretty severe air turbulence. Thought the, th- the plane was okay, realized that the, what, what I just seen was a surface air missile, thinking, what the heck was that? And it brought us right back into um, starting to uh, resume our focus. Now, this never should have happened. Uh, we'd seen, I'm going to guess, somewhere in the range of 50 surface air missiles in our uh, 10 months of combat and got up close and personal, maybe a dozen or so. So we knew what to do against them, but we were flying straight and level at the wrong airspeed, paying no attention to what was going on in the cockpit, and it almost cost us our lives. So the aircraft ended up not being okay. Uh, give us a brief summary of the rest of the story, if you would. Sure. The plane continued to fly, and I said, wow, you know, this brought us right back to a, a reality situation here. It's just starting, looking back at the radar now, looking at the electronic equipment, and Randy said, hey, you know, we're, we're okay. And as we continue to fly, we still continue to climb. And as we did, I remember there were several MiGs that were down at treetop level when we were uh, starting this climb. I, as I looked over my left shoulder to look to see where they were, I noticed they were climbing toward our position, and the turtleback area of the fuselage on the left side was on fire. So I reported that to Randy. I said, hey, Randy, we're on fire on the left side. And he came back and said, yeah, Roger, we're losing. And the FO, we have a, a PC-1, PC-2, and a, and a utility hydraulic. And he said, we're losing uh, one of our main hydraulics and our utility hydraulic. So... As he was telling me that, the plane started to fly sideways, and we're still, at this point, maybe 20 miles inside enemy territory. So now we got our hands full just trying to uh, regain control of the plane. Obviously, over enemy territory is not a place you want to be with a crippled aircraft because, as you know, and probably you had friends, uh, a lot of them ended up as prisoners of war. 
And so what did it take to get out over the water? We read an article, and we talked about this, in the, um, a Naval Aviation Safety magazine called Approach, when a, um, a Navy pilot had written an article about he had been hit by a surface-to-air missile and started losing his hydraulics. So rather than using this, his stick to control the airplane, he instead decided to use the rud- just the rudders, thinking he wouldn't use up as much hydraulic fluid if he did it that way. So we use the same technique, and when the plane would come up, uh, we were any put in left or right rudder, whichever way it was rolling, use almost no stick input. When it came through the bottom of this uh, rolling loop, I uh, think of it almost like a, a barrel roll maneuvers with very little G. That's what we were doing. We came through the bottom. We didn't want to hit the ground, so we put a little back stick in to get the nose up above the horizon and just leave it alone, whichever way it wanted to go. So we did that maybe three or four times, but each time the loop got a little more sloppy. So the last time, right as we're approaching the coast, the plane went into heavy wing rock back and forth, then flipped inverted and went into uh, an upside-down spin. And meanwhile, you're on fire. Correct. And other aircraft, I believe, are yelling at you to eject. But Correct. But you didn't want to eject until you were at least feet wet, if you could help it. So at this point, though, the aircraft's no longer flying. You're just over the coast. Right. And uh, um, the calls that are being made to us are, uh, F-4 in a spin, get out of the airplane, get out of the airplane. Who are you talking to? We didn't hear any of those calls because our radios were burned out. But it was uh, it was pretty intense. It was uh, fire in the cockpit. Not a lot, but on the left-hand side right where I sit, the uh, bunch of circuit breakers, I was hoping they didn't co- cook off the smoke. I couldn't read the gauges because it was pretty smoky. It was a pretty pretty unpleasant situation. Um, toward the end, when we went into this inverted spin, um, one of my jobs in a situation like this was to eject us. And we have a handle that sits between our legs. We have another one up above us called the face curtain, but I was squished against the top of the canopy, so I couldn't get to the one between my legs, so I... I ended up doing a one-armed handstand with my left hand, and I just got a couple of knuckles on the handle, gave it a yank, and and then ejected us both. Wow. And now, if you were off the seat, did you not get any seat slap or any uh, back problems out of that? I didn't, but we were pretty excited at this time. So I don't don't recall. uh, (laughs) I think we ejected probably at 180 knots, and some might say, well, what was that like? Think of yourself being tied to a chair and being thrown out of a a 102-story building into a 180-mile-an-hour wind. You might say, what was that wind blast like? I'm sure it was it was something, but I don't recall at all that it being substantial because we were pretty excited at that point. Well, and the alternative was to ride a stricken aircraft into the sea, and that certainly Correct. is not a good idea. So you eject both of you, save both of your lives. You, you're floating down, but just because your feet wet doesn't mean the danger is over. Particularly for me because when I joined the Navy, I didn't know how to swim. So... <laughs> So I was on um, sub-swim for 20 weeks, and then I was a two-week swim hold. But when I learned how to relax in the water, I couldn't believe how easy it was. So coming down, it was right at the mouth of the enemy's harbor, and they immediately dispatched a couple PT boats into our position. The enemy did. So I broadcast my position. I was called Showtime 100 Bravo. I believe we call the enemy's harbor Point 66, and we called enemy uh, boats Skunks. So the call went something like this. This is Showtime 100 Bravo, two skunks vectoring my position, point sixty six. And the uh, controller that I spoke to said, Roger, come up, I believe it was 2828, the backup uh, frequency. And we, we did and broadcast a little bit more and then we came up, put, turned the beeper on and then uh, came down, landed in the water. For someone like me that was a non-swimmer before I joined the Navy, to say that water entry was uneventful, please consider the source. But... Did all the things that they teach us how to do, you know, got the mask on one side, got the gloves off, hit the water, flipped over my back, uh, got the coke fittings off, got away from the chute, got into the raft. All the things that they trained us to do at work just like a training exercise. That's amazing. And the 2828 you refer to is the UHF frequency in megahertz, 282 Correct. point. A 243.0 yeah. was the primary guard, and 2820, right. I think, was the backup. And we still use that, actually, for uh, search and rescue. Sure. Okay, so you're in the water. You've got enemy boats bearing down on you. How do you end up back in friendly hands at the end of this whole story? We're in the water maybe 20 minutes. Um, the Navy dispatched. There were four aircraft carriers in the area. They dispatched uh, several attack airplanes, A-7s, came out, engaged the PT boats in a firefight, and sank them. Now, coming down, uh, the ocean looked like a mill pond. But I was surprised when I hit the water. It wasn't a mill pond. The waves were pretty big. It took me a little time to 
get away, paddle away from the, the shoot, even though I was disconnected from it, and then get it. And initially, we'd been shaking so bad during the dogfight flying, the dogfights with the enemy that my legs, I didn't want them to cramp up, but they, uh, my legs and back was, was sore from all the shaking from previously. So I, I just told myself, you know, they teach you to do a flutter kick to get into the raft. And I said, I got to just rest for a minute here before I get into the raft because I'm, uh, really put my body through a pretty intense half hour here. Uh, well, I would say, I mean, not only were you a carrier aviator launching from a carrier, then you had to bomb some flak sites, shoot down three enemy, and then get shot down yourself. That would be, I would think, a, an eventful day for anyone. Uh, but at any rate, they, uh, A7, your friends there, uh, even though there was a lo little, I won't call it animosity, but maybe a little rivalry between the fighter and the attack guys, they sure saved your bacon and uh, allowed the friendly helos to come pick you up, and they took you back to your ship. That's exactly right. Now, it, I would it was uh, I would say friendly competition. Sure. I, I, we've um, always had great respect and admiration for what they did with the, just the bombing work. They were air to ground guys and did a great job with that. And they, they these folks that came out that day and engaged those PT boats did a great job for us. Well, when it comes down to it, uh, we're all on the same team. So a little uh, animosity I knew was too strong of a word. You know, friendly competition, right. a little rivalry, but you're all clearly on the same team. Well, that is a harrowing story. Thank you for sharing that, Willie D. Uh, you and I first met almost 20 years ago uh, when you presented your air combat lesson to my Top Gun class. Uh, the year was 2000. Uh, you've been giving that class and acting as a consultant to Top Gun for nearly, actually over a quarter century. Uh, why give that class and what keeps you coming back and continuing to give it? You know, I was approached some time ago by uh, Top Gun to see if I'd be willing to put together a presentation on my lessons learned. And I was, I've just wanted to uh, fade into the sunset. I'd already started a, a, a commercial real estate career and felt I was a, um, an old timer and a has been and been happy to just move along to a different uh, chapter in my life. It took them probably a year to convince me I should do this. And when I finally said I would put something together, they said, and of course we want to murder board it. And I said to myself, as a former training officer, I said to myself, having been out of the Navy now 15 years, do I want to go through a murder board? So I said, well, heck, I'll, whatever they think is appropriate. But I, in the course of putting it together, I felt that our five kills and 170 combat missions was sufficient. But as I started working on this, I realized it wasn't. So what I did over the next six to eight months was I interviewed 26 other aces to find out how they became aces. Actually, they're all gone now. I interviewed, I interviewed four fellows from World War I, um, uh, three or four from Korea, a couple from Vietnam, and about 16 or 17 from World War II. The Aces accounted for 212 kills and about 1,000 combat missions, and it was a fascinating collection of folks. I would imagine. Did you also interview Eric Hartman? I interviewed Hartman uh, not face-to-face. -face. Um, we ha had a Luftwaffe crew come through Top Gun. I got friendly with one of them, and we exchanged Christmas cards. He happened to be out here in San Diego back in the mid-1990s, and he called me up. I went and met with him, and I was telling him about the work I was doing at Top Gun, and and he got to talking to me and said that his uh, his father had been in the squadron with Booby Hartman, he called him. Right. So I said that I had read Hartman's book called The Blonde Knight of Germany. I found some of it hard to believe that, you know, I realized Eric Hartman shot down 352 planes. 352, and he was a German. He was a German. He didn't get into the war till the end of 1942. Wow. His mother taught him how to fly. Uh, she was a glider pilot. But he got shot down 17 times himself. Two different times he got shot down twice the same day. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. How is that possible? I mean, obviously he survived all those shoot downs, but he'd get shot down, what, near his own base and then go run and jump in another airplane? Exactly what he'd do. <laughs> but what I found fascinating was of that that um, the two times he got shot down twice the same day on on one of the one of those uh, days, the next day he went out and shot down six airplanes on the next mission and 11 total that day. So I read all this, though. I found it hard to believe. So what I did was my friend, I said, can I write you a letter? And I've got some questions I want to ask Mr. Hartman. He said, certainly. So I wrote this fellow a letter. I didn't hear anything about a year and a half, two years. I figured I must have got lost in the mail or something. You know, I didn't think much more of it. And about two years after that, I get a phone call. He's back in San Diego with his family for Christmas, and he's he's got something for me. So I get out and meet with him, have a... Uh, he he uh, runs a vineyard over in Germany, and what he'd done is he'd gone over to Hartman's house with the questions that I had asked, and he asked Hartman, and Hartman answered the questions, and it was I got it on a tape, 
and Hartman provided the answers. As Hartman's wife was there, she would translate some of it because his English was was pretty average. So some of the answers were in English, some were in German and, and broken English. But it was fascinating to see his criteria on when he was going to engage, when he was going to bug out, um, how he looked at flying fighters and his whole approach to it. And that is an amazing book. I read it as well. Uh, incredible. Um, so from so many ways, not just the successes that he had, but the toll that it takes on him and others. Uh, so you took these lessons from various aces, including Eric Hartman, and you created a class that you give to all Top Gun students. Right. And in that class, you talk about your personal experiences, but also just the differences between training and combat, or what is it you hope that, that the student takes away from that class? Well, the, the thing that I noticed that I, I found so interesting with the aces was the fact that uh, they account for less than 4% of those that have ever flown fighters in, in real air combat, yet they account for greater than 40% of the airplanes shot down. So how come such a small percentage accounts for such a large percentage of the shoot downs? So what I wanted to convey to the, the audiences I've come into contact with up at Top Gun, the tension and anxiety and fear is almost uh, unimaginable. It's, it's your constant companion. But the fear left unchecked turns to panic. And once panic sets in, chances for success are severely reduced. So what I try to convey to the students up at Top Gun when I'm up there is here are the techniques the aces used when they had the fear, but they kept the fear under control so they're able to achieve the mission. Now realize uh, when enemy airplanes were airborne, 90% of the other friendly planes that are out there in the same piece of sky as the aces didn't get even one kill. So the question is, these aces certainly, you know, and, and most of them, believe it or not, were, were, were pretty humble guys, didn't think it was any big deal, just did what they were trained to do and just said some planes popped up in front of them and they, this kind of thing. And it was not the, 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 the scoff in the wind or the uh, macho swagger that you might think. It was a pretty humbling experience for all of us. I can imagine. I, I spend part of this podcast's effort in dispelling stereotypes in Hollywood and whatnot. So I appreciate you adding to that. You know, Willie D, the, uh, the biggest thing I remember from that class, other than just being mesmerized by your story, and you brought in the radio, the communications from that, uh, was when you demonstrated <laughs> your visual scan of outside. You, you literally showed the class your head going up and down, left and right, and it looked like it was in some kind of crazy mode. But you had to do that in those days just to pick up, I guess, any bandits that might try to roll in on your six or surface air missiles. But for whatever reason, that stuck with me the most. But you really do use your experiences to teach the young students, if you will, the next generation of, hey, it's one thing to talk about it, but when you're out there, like you said, if panic sets in, you're doomed because you've got to keep control of yourself. That's exactly right. And, you know, it's the kind of thing I'm, I thought I was doing this one time for Top Gun for the staff. And after I did it one time, they asked if I'd be willing to come back to do it for the class, and I thought I was doing it for one class. I never know from class to class if I'm, going to, if I'm going to get invited back. They critique it, which they should, and I'm always sensitive to They've got lots of things going on, and I fully understand, but I'm, I'm surprised it's lasted this long. But what I've, I'm focused on is, is not so much the tactics that we employed, but the uh, physiological elements you deal with and the attitude and the mindset that, that aces have. That, uh, and we all struggle. Uh, the aces are not born. They're made. And we all struggle with the anxieties of the moment. But the idea behind it is to uh, put that aside, have some system in place so that you can get through it to deal with the fear because it left unchecked, as mentioned, it will turn to panic. For sure. I remember being so enthralled with that class that a couple classes later when you came back, um, my brother happened to be in town. He's a civilian, worked at the time for a major motorcycle corporation. And I asked if it would be okay for him to attend, and he did. And he still speaks of it to this day, almost 20 years later, uh, uh, because he just, of course, has no military affiliation other than me. So for him, it was just amazing to sit and listen to you talk about that. In your book, you state that peak performance is a result of planning plus preparation plus focus plus assessment plus improvement plus self-discipline. And again, you've come up with that from having interviewed all these aces. Uh, how, what specifically, though, led you to come up with that formula in that order? Good question. I recognize I mentioned uh, interviewing the 26 aces. As a professional speaker now, I've, I've been a professional speaker for the last 20 years, do about 30 corporate events a year around the country. And my typical audience size is a three to 500. And I, f I focus on the defense industry and financial services companies. 
and I don't give canned presentations. So before I uh, go into an audience, I want to speak to the uh, senior executives, the CEOs, or you know the senior people there. And I usually interview three to four of them. And it usually takes each interview takes, oh gosh, from maybe thirty to forty or so minutes. I'm interested in the two or three things that people do well, the two or three things they don't do well, the two or three biggest challenges they face, and in one sentence what they like to see is the takeaway. So I take that, I blend it all in. Now, on one hand, I have how the aces got to become aces, and on the other hand, I have how these highly successful business people got to the point in life where they're at. I take both of those elements, blend them in together. There are some differences, but there's some surprising similarities. And one of the things that I've, I've noted through the years, as we've often said, the will to succeed is of little value without the will to prepare. For sure. Now, if I tried to hold you to it, is there one of those six traits that you feel is the, the most important? Well, you, you know, the, I would say they're all important. Probably the first among equals is probably the, uh, you know, the importance of self-discipline. It's the glue that holds it together. You know, as I've, we've often said, anybody can be self-disciplined on occasion. But that's not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about that gritty day in and day out self-discipline. And when I speak to my, my audiences, even the, the folks up at Top Gun, I have a little handheld mirror. And I call it the, the, the drill we do is the face in the mirror. And I ask them to look in the mirror and, and see what they see when it comes to self-discipline because that's the glue that holds the other things together. Would you say that is what most of your clients struggle with the most is the self-discipline or is there one that stands out to you that most often is lacking when you go to these organizations? Oh, it's, it's a combination of things. You know, I, 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 I talk uh, and spend a fair amount of time on the importance of approachability, accountability. We talk about where accountability starts. You know, uh, I find that organizations today, uh, they're all being asked uh, to do more with less. People are wearing three and four different hats. You know, money's tight. Everybody's uh, not running scared, but running really uh, tense. They've got families at home, children. In many cases, they bring work home at night. They're they're just beat when they come home, and they got to try to get themselves ready as best they can uh, the next day. So I would say uh, uh, just as a general statement, I, I noticed there's a, a lot of burnout out there with, with uh, the companies I come into contact with through no fault of their own. They're just being asked to do so much, and resources are tighter today than they've ever been. Very true. You've taken your lessons from combat and interviewing aces and a lifetime of service and success and turned them into an outstanding leadership book and a prolific speaking schedule. Uh, what are your objectives now? You know, um, my wife asked me the same question, and she wants to know how much longer I'm going to work. <laughs> and my feeling on that is, you know, I, I think uh, I'm aware of the fact that I have a unique resume, and I, I don't speak from a theoretical standpoint and when I speak to my audiences, I don't say this is what you should do or anything to that effect. What I say to them instead, the way I frame it out is I say, this is what worked for us when it mattered most and life or death hung in the balance. And, I, and from that perspective, I talk about how we put our combat teams together, how we lead our combat teams. And again, I don't mean to suggest I have the secret sauce, but I do say that when it mattered most, this is what worked. Well, you have credibility because you've been there, done that, you've been tested and tried, and you've had some experiences that the rest of us only read about. So we appreciate, on behalf of those organizations and companies, uh, we certainly appreciate that you're willing to share it. And so, you know, we're glad you still have the energy to uh, do that. Uh, Willie D., if you are willing, I have some questions from the listeners. I told them I'd be coming to see you, and here are a few. So uh, the first is from Ryan. And he says, this may be sort of off topic, uh, but he says, on May 10th, 1972, so again, that was the day you got your third, fourth, and fifth kills, uh, VA-146 and VA-147 A-7 squadrons engaged MiG-17s, now this is Ryan's uh, point of view, so if he's incorrect, you can tell him, uh, engaged MiG-17s but had no sidewinders because all the available A-9s were given to the F-4 crews. Given the fact that VA-146 and VA-147 were in Air Wing 9 with VF-92 and VF-96, is there any truth to this story? And before you answer, he says, thank you for being a role model and thank you for your service. Well, it's a good question, but I don't believe there's any truth in that because, uh, as I recall, the A-7s had two sidewinders, and the whole idea there was that their primary mission was air to ground, but you never know what's going to happen out there, and, and they had the sidewinders in case something happened that they might need them. And in fact, I've got uh, Randy's Fox 2 book here in my backpack, 
And there are pictures in there. One is of an A7 with the Sidewinder loaded on its, uh, I guess, the fuselage station. I'm right. not sure what they call it. Um, but ostensibly for self-defense. Or, or, Correct. But, but you, again, you never know. You Maybe never rolls know. out in front of you. Right. Did you know of any A7s that got any kills? You know, I don't think any did. I know there were several that uh, uh, saw MiGs, I think, the day that we got jumped by somewhere in the range of 28 MiGs. Wow. Uh, there were several A7s that were circling back to see what was going on, and <laughs> as they did, they were uh, attracting MiGs. Oh, so. I can imagine. Well, <laughs> you know, some people get buck fever, and they just think they can do whatever they can do, or maybe they wish they had picked up fighters in training uh, flight school. Okay, now I have a question from Vico, who asks, if Top Gun was created because of poor combat results, uh, parentheses, and as far as I've read, air-to-air training was pretty much non-existent those days, especially dissimilar air combat training, then why were some pilots much better than others? Was it because of previous experience or natural talent or more specialized squadrons? You know, the early Top Gun, uh, the first Top Gun instructors came out of the uh, F-8 community. And they had uh, these gun detachments, and and, uh, there was a very small group of folks that knew how to fly uh, air combat maneuvering uh, uh, very well. The thinking by the Navy at that time was the technology was such that all of the kills were going to be beyond visual range and that the actual maneuvering dogfight was a thing of the past, so it wasn't emphasized. But as I recall, that alt report that that, uh, was responsible for bringing about Top Gun, a guy named Captain Frank Alt was asked to write a report to find out why the Navy fired 68 air-to-air missiles and didn't hit anybody. And I think the other main issue was our exchange ratio for all wars prior to the start of Top Gun had been 18 to 1. And the first half of the Vietnam War, the exchange ratio was 2 to 1, meaning for every two airplanes we knocked down, we lost one. So that was an alarmingly bad trend for for, uh, the Navy and for U.S. fighter forces. So Captain Alt did this research and came back and said, the problem is the pilots don't know how to fly the dogfight mission. So there was a, a huge amount of emphasis. And so the Navy said, who are the best seven or eight dogfighters we've got in the entire inventory? And they found those folks, brought them in. They became the first Top Gun instructors. And the whole idea was to now develop a postgraduate level training school in the air-to-air fighter tactics. And we, in fact, had an episode on that recently with the current commanding officer of Top Gun, uh, Grand Mariner. So in that case, to answer his question... Just like in anything in life, there are people that just have natural ability that exceeds others, or maybe they work harder, but you sought those people out, or not you, but the Navy right. did, to, uh, to start that. Exactly right. Was there any, were there specialized squadrons at the time? Was, was the one VF different than the other? Uh, you were, let's see, VF-92 and VF-96, did they essentially perform the same roles in your air wing? They performed the same roles. Of course, I'm in VF-96, so I refer to VF-92 as Brand X. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm sure likewise they refer to us that way. But the fact of the matter is we were close personal friends. We hung out together, pulled Liberty together, and a uh, great bunch of guys at their end. And we're all in the, saluting the same flag all in the, for the same purpose. Awesome. All right, next question is from a gentleman named Harry. He says, Pilots and backseaters in the F-4 were known to sometimes have rocky, uncooperative working relationships in the Air Force. How did the Navy foster cooperation between the two aviators back then, and how long did it take for pilots and RIOs to form a useful working partnership? You know, the Navy approach, uh, they did not have pilots in the backseat, uh, unlike the Air Force who did. We, they had uh, The Navy's approach, they had specifically trained, we were called radar intercept officers, and we crewed up. Now, and I don't, I'm not bad mouth Air Force's approach, but you might fly with uh, one fella on Monday, a different person Tuesday, a different person Wednesday. You never flew with the same person twice, or really did. We always flew with the same person. And what happened was we, we learned the strengths and weaknesses of each other. We became very good friends. You know, not, uh, not best, best, best friends, but uh, at some point there's a, there's a, a distance and a respect, but uh, mutually checking each other to make sure things are happening the way they're supposed to. But I always felt the Navy's approach was a good one because I knew Cunningham's strengths and weaknesses, where he should be and not be in certain elements of the fight, and he knew mine. And I, I, I call him wild man. So he always knew when I was talking to him it was me, and he called me Irish. So I always knew when he was well, back and forth. We always knew when we were talking to each other. And in those situations we found ourselves in, it had to be an absolute rock-solid element of trust. When I told him to break left, to break right, um, I, I didn't. He, he couldn't pause or hesitate because more than likely there was somebody had us under attack that he didn't see, and it had to be an instantaneous break. And that's the way. It, and, it, and it was. That's the way it worked. 
Wow. I can only imagine. So are you saying the Air Force would put pilots in the back seat? So on Monday, I might fly in the front seat, but Tuesday, I might fly in the back? I'm not sure. I think if you were a, a, a pilot in command, you'd be, you'd be in the front seat. But there would be a guy who had his wings, his pilot wings, in the back seat. Oh, wow. So there was a lot of, you know, who's, and they had flight controls in the back seat. With the F-4, it didn't. We had just a weapon system. So I knew what my job was, and I was uh, trained real hard to be real, as good as I could be at it, as, as was often been said. Uh, I, I put myself and Cunningham in this category. Uh, we were uh, maybe above, slightly above average, but, but not much more. Just we weren't the best in the squadron. I don't want your listeners to think we were naturals or anything like this. We were hardworking and spent a lot of time getting ourselves up to, up to what we considered acceptable speed. But um, there were others in the squadron much stronger than uh, Randy as uh, pilots and much stronger uh, than me as Rios. Neither one of us was good enough to be selected to come to Top Gun. Until this this thing happened, we shot down the five planes. So, it it uh, what enabled us to get there and to remain there was probably a combination of uh, we were well trained, we were lucky, and it just wasn't our time to go. And we had we worked well together. Well, yeah, but I would add to that humility as well. Clearly, as that is the case. All right, my next question is from Steve. I believe he's from Canada. He says, how was Commander Driscoll able to do his job, and he puts a single quotation mark around the word job, in the backseat, when he really didn't know how the F-4 was going to maneuver? Must take massive concentration. So I guess what he's getting at there is you don't have the controls, you don't know if the aircraft's going to suddenly bank left or right, and yet you're a part of this crew, and you have to do, quote-unquote, your job. Sure, good question. The advantage of flying with the same pilot and the same Rio day in and day out. I, I knew based on the tactical situation what he'd done in the past, what he was going to do, how hard he was going to turn, uh, what his technique was, if he was going to get too slow, go up in the vertical, try to outzoom the uh, the opponent. I had a, a very good feel because we'd flown so much together. I, I, I knew his tendencies, uh, m- very familiar with them as he knew mine. So I don't recall ever being in a situation uh, that that I was like really surprised at what he did with the plane because we f- we flew all the time together. So we, um, as I saw the tactical situation, I knew just what he was go- what I knew what the correct thing was to do, and I knew what he was going to do to to address it. You had the benefit of familiarity and habitually with that pilot, so correct. you knew that right. in a certain situation he would most likely do this. With exactly the right. Awesome. Steve goes on, and I'll see if I can paraphrase this. He wants to know that, uh, or he wants to know, in close quarters, and we've talked about this already in our interview. Um, what does the Rio do? He says the pilot deals with the visuals and, uh, and the target, uh, but is the Rio continuing to track for others, or does he deal with locking up the one that he's trying to shoot, or is the Rio looking for other threats? So, um, and who fire? He wants to know who fires the weapons as well. Sure, the pilot fires the weapons. The Rio's job is to uh, run the radios, the navigation system, the radar, the electronic countermeasures, the electronic counter countermeasures, and then provide support. Uh, defensive support as we're, we're doing all the offensive side of it to make sure there are, there are not other threats, either surface-to-air or air-to-air types that are attacking us in the process of us uh, doing the, uh, the offensive side of the work. So in the proverbial canoe example, uh, the pilot is wrangling the one closest and you're looking out for the next alligator Correct. that is right. coming over to threaten you. And, and Steve's last question is, do you get extra pay and promotion for being an ace? I wish we did, but I, but we're all tre- which I think is actually correct. We're all treated the same, as it should be, as we should be. Correct. Because a lot of what you said was luck. A lot of it was luck, being in the right place at the right time, being well trained, and and I really want to leave it at that. But it's that's really what uh, what it boiled down to. Sure, but luck, some would say, is also the marriage of preparation and opportunity. There, there's some truth in that, but I mean, my view has always been that there were many others uh, as competent, as well qualified as us, if not more so, many others. And if given the same opportunities, they would have done just as well, if not better, than, than we did. We happen to be in the right place at the right time. But as if Randy Cunningham was sitting here, he's, he would smile and say, yes, but we didn't screw anything up. I would smile right back at him and say, well, yes, we did. You got us shut down. <laughs> You got us. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, Willie D slash Irish on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. We have a little tradition that we explain our guests' call signs at the end of our discussion. Uh, yours both seem fairly straightforward. Uh, any any story about either of your call signs? Well, you know, um, of course, my name is William Driscoll. Willie D, uh, Irish, Randy called me. Uh, I started out with, I never... Uh, 
embraced this with a lot of enthusiasm, but I accidentally burned down part of a motel when I was in college. <laughs> so my call sign, it started out being motel, uh, which I'm, I'm okay with that. Some, some of my old friends still call me that. But I, you know, it, it, when you get a little older in life, you're just glad anybody calls you anything. So I would never, uh, never quibbled over too much. You know how call signs are. Generally, it's something you don't want to have is what you end up with. Oh, yes. Uh, so. We had an entire episode on that. Well, the book is Peak Performance Under Pressure, How to Achieve Extraordinary Results Under the Most Difficult Circumstances. Your website is williedriscoll.com, and it has more information and lists a phone number and email should people want to contact you or book you to speak at their organizations. Is there anywhere else people can follow you? You know, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn, and probably the best way to get in touch with me, though, is through that the website, which is uh, just very simply williedriscoll.com, and Willie spelled W-I-L-L-Y. The uh, beauty of contacting me, if, if you wish to get a book, is I can personally sign the books. If you get it at Amazon, they'll just send you the book. Uh, we're hooked up with a group called the Semper Fi Fund, so we're making a 10% donation to this fund. They were set up to help serious wounded members of armed forces and their families. So when you're buying a book, you're supporting our wounded troops. Outstanding. Well, if I can figure out how to do this, still a bit of a newbie at some of the technology in my podcasting here, but we'll figure out a way to put a link to that and uh, make that opportunity available for our listeners. Well, you, sir, are an American hero. It was my honor to have you on the show today. On behalf of the thousands of Fighter Pilot Podcast listeners, thank you for your lifetime of service to this great nation and to your fellow man. Uh, thank you also for your many sacrifices. We all want to wish you continued health and prosperity in the years and endeavors ahead. And it's just really been a pleasure and an honor to be here in your presence. I've, I've spoken to you many times over the years at various functions, and I, I know a lot of your story. But I do appreciate, as do my listeners, you taking the time to share it with this audience. Uh, thank you. And I would just, in, in closing, like to wish your listeners a, a long and peaceful life. Thank you. All right. Well, once again, what an honor to be in Willie D. Driscoll's home and to hear that story. I know you enjoyed it as well. After we turned off the microphones, he said that he had one final story for us, so I turned it back on, and if you stick around after the closing music here and the flyby, we will share that with you there. I understand this was an irregular format for a show, but stick around next time. We'll go back to that normal format. In the meantime, I'd like to announce that the music featured in the opening and closing bumpers was provided by www.bensound.com, and... As always, I want to tell you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. If you have a question for the show, you can message us on Facebook or send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or you can leave a message on our listener line at 877-MOCK-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can find us on all the social media platforms you might expect, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You can hear the show on our website, on iTunes, and on Stitcher and Spotify. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating and or review on iTunes or anywhere else it's supported, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, well, that will do it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. We'll see you next time. I want to tell you one interesting thing that happened to me about two months ago. Now, of the five airplanes we shot down, four of the enemy pilots had no chance to eject. The missile either had caused a catastrophic explosion to their airplane or they hit, impacted the ground shortly, shortly within seconds after impact. One pilot did eject, though, and when he did, we almost hit him as we made our hard turn to uh, actually avoid hitting him after the missile impacted his airplane. His airplane decelerated rapidly. Didn't think too much of it at the time. Now, 45 years later, now it's about two months ago, I get a phone call that 12 North Vietnamese fighter pilots are going to be visiting the United States, and would I be willing to come to the San Diego Aerospace Museum to participate in a panel discussion on what happened on the day we shot down the three MiGs, and sitting on the stage next to me would be several of the pilots that participated in that mission. These are the enemy pilots. So to my right was the radar intercept officer in the plane that was in severe trouble, 
that this enemy plane was attacking when we shot him down, almost hit the pilot. And to my left was two, two of the enemy pilots are out there on that mission. When we were done with, with the interview, it was interesting because as I was talking, the 12 North Vietnamese pilots with their wives were sitting right in the very front. I, I, I wondered several times during the course of the presentation what the wives were thinking. When I concluded uh, the, my portion of the remarks and as we were leaving the stage, one of the translators came up to me and said that someone wanted to meet me. We walked over to, we were in the San Diego Aerospace, Aerospace Museum Rotunda, and the actual F-4 Phantom that Randy Cunningham and I flew to, to shoot down our first two MiGs is actually mounted down there. It's a monument to all those uh, Navy and Marine aviators that flew during the Vietnam War. It's called Fly Navy Vietnam. But standing under the plane was a thin North Vietnamese gentleman, and he was introduced to me by the translator as the first ace from North Vietnam with seven U.S. kills. As we got to talking, uh, the translator told me that he also feels that he was shot down by us in the spring of 1972 because he said the plane that shot him down came very close aboard when he got shot down. So we looked at each other, shook hands, hugged. It was quite an interesting experience. He also pointed to the MiG that was mounted right in front of our F-4 Phantom. The number was 3020. It had seven red stars, and he said that was his airplane. So it was a somewhat of a surreal coincidence to meet what could have been the, one of the pilots we shot down and to have him point to his airplane. So I would say, as I uh, concluded that particular experience, I say this to my audiences many times, when events in life happen, depending on, on what happens, take what happened in the past, learn your lesson from it, but then forget the past because it's already forgotten you. But what we do in the present is going to determine What's going to happen to us in the future? Now, I came real close to not wanting to get out and participate in this panel discussion, but I decided it would be a unique opportunity, so I did. And before I left this gentleman, he wanted to know if I'd be willing to come to North Vietnam to speak at a North Vietnamese fighter pilots reunion. I'm still thinking about it, but I'm, I'm inclined to probably think I'll, I'm likely to say yes at some point. So very interesting experience.